Have your way, God. In Jesus' name, amen. Can you remember pre-pandemic, of course, when the paradigm shifted, when the story changed in your life? I know this has happened to a great many of us when we are celebrating with lots of family and friends pre-pandemic. Maybe a family reunion, maybe a holiday, maybe a birthday, maybe a church dinner. But anyway, there you are having a good time with the multitudes of multiple perspectives and multiple identities, having a good time. And slowly, gradually, consistently, folks start leaving, exiting one by one, family by family, group by group. And then you found, find the only joyful sounds that remain are the ones you conjure up in your memories. You look around and the kitchen is a mess. Dishes everywhere, discarded food, half drank sodas. Somebody even had the nerve to leave gum stuck on the bottom of that plate. Not only do you have to figure out how to organize this massive cleanup, but you got to figure out what in the world to do with the leftovers. I know my sister Sheila and Angela know what I'm talking about. When you didn't think there was enough to go around, you always seem to end up with something left over. Where are the leftovers going to fit in the refrigerator? Are there enough bowls? Should I be lazy and put the whole pot in the fridge? Do I wrap up the cornbread in aluminum foil or put it in plastic bag for dressing later? Question after question after question pops up in your mind. And if you're anything like me, I used to be nosy. <laughs> and when the grown folks gathered in the living room, my siblings and I, we used to have, wash, have to wash dishes based on, when I came along, it was based on weeks, not months. So and then we went to days of washing dishes. But anyway, uh, when I was a kid and the grown folks were gathered in the living room, I used to <laughs> ask my mother and father stupid stuff about leftovers because I really didn't want to wash the dishes. I would even do stupid things like take the empty turnip green pot into the living room to show how much was left because I didn't know if I should save the green juice or not since it technically is leftovers. This turnip green juice was clearly leftovers. How long is long enough to keep leftovers? How many times do you eat leftovers? Do you have to say the grace over leftovers if the grace was already said when the food was fresh? Well, as I began to organize the massive cleanup, questions would pop up in my mind. And the real truth is I didn't want to be left in the kitchen to clean it up by myself with all those dishes and those nasty leftovers. Leftovers, what does that really mean? My mother has always said that she doesn't care to eat leftovers. Well, leftovers are something that remains unused or unconsumed. An example, a leftover food is served at a later meal. From a theological perspective or understanding of God, I believe that leftovers occur when we are trying to be stingy or selfish and it is God's way of reminding us that if we would just trust in God, God is able to take our little bit and give us so much more that we thought humanly impossible. Leftovers, beloved, don't be greedy or stingy when it comes to God's blessings. God's grace is sufficient and God will supply all of our needs according to God's riches in glory. God gives us each day our daily bread. How much stuff do we really need? Last I checked, most of us only have two feet. 
Yet I bet you a dollar to a donut, most of us have more shoes than we could wear in a lifetime. Last I checked, most of us only have one body, but I bet you a dollar to a donut. Our closets are filled to capacity, got clothes hanging everywhere. Has this ever happened to anybody in Zoom land other than me? You got so much food in your freezer and cabinets till you end up throwing stuff out because it's gone bad. Instead of giving it away before it stinks, as Langston Hughes says, like rotten meat. And we are seeing every day the food banks fill to capacity of folks needing the basic necessities during this pandemic. God help this nation if we don't extend benefits to the most vulnerable. And Lord, have mercy upon our greedy nature. We have the tendency to say what's a sin. For most folks in this country, being a glutton ain't never talked about. It ain't on the list of stuff we think will cause folks to break the bottom out of hell because we know we got that gluttonous spirit because of our extravagant and luxurious American lifestyle. Most pious and holy greedy folks are the first ones to say who's going to hell because they're curvy or not Christian, yet our apathy is big and fat and we can't see the direct antithesis to the kingdom of God's grace that is more than enough to satisfy. And now, those mega church buildings are reduced to a virtual empty building reality. Beloved, God can show us better than we can tell us. There is an inflated ego obesity op epidemic. We would rather have a fickle foolishness than faith food. Our physical bodies might be satisfied, but our souls are starving for malnutrition because we have eaten erroneous exclusionary teachings. We have ingested hatred. We may even drink from the shallow springs that are filled with folly, fake and faith. Funk. Believe it, doc when doctors have long said that what we eat has a direct effect on our overall well-being and health. They say uh, apple a day keeps doctors away. It has an element of truth. Eating healthy, exercising, and getting proper amount of rest has a direct effect on our attitudes as well. We are less grumpy and irritable when we have done right by our bodies. In fact, our bodies are the temple of the Most High God, the place where the holy resides. Fast foods are convenient, but family time is critical. Sit down, eat together, talk together, share a meal together. Every opportunity Jesus got, he broke bread and fellowship with his friends. It is true. We are what we eat, and if we consume garbage, we're going to emit garbage. If we ingest and digest gossip and envy, we'll become busybodies and jealous, unhappy people. If we surround ourselves with folks who are not healthy for us, we become mentally unhealthy and unstable too. If we feast on bad habits... We become those bad habits. If all that ever goes into our mouths is filth, then we pump into our hearts and minds trash, mess, negativity, and nonsense. Beloved, we are what we eat. What we eat has a direct effect on our overall well-being and health. An apple a day keeps the doctor away. Cranberries are great antioxidants. And bananas aid in depression. Almonds are a good source of fiber. Oat milk can lower cholesterol. Water is good for everything. Walking 30 minutes a day can decrease the recurrence of breast cancer. Exercising and resistance training can tone up an out of shape body and tone down arthritis. Eating healthy, exercising, and getting the proper amount of rest has a direct effect on our attitudes. And if you cut out too much sugar, you might just become bitter. And ain't nothing worse than a healthy, bitter being emitting negativity and crotchiness. Being a grumpy old man or a crotchety old woman ain't cute. I don't have any better sense than to believe 
that God can sweeten us up if we taste and see that God is good. Beloved, God has provided just enough and will give us leftovers. The manna, the matzah, the showbread was symbolic of the presence and provision of God in Israelite history. And when they all had enough to eat, Jesus said to his disciples, gather the pieces that are left over. Let nothing be wasted. So they gathered them and filled 12 baskets with the pieces of five barley loaves left over from those who had eaten in feeding of the multitude. Multitudes. The 12 baskets of leftovers is a reminder of God's multiplication miracles with the multitudes. Can I teach? The story of the feeding of the 5,000 is the only one of Jesus' miracles told in all four of the Gospels. It is in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Why is this miracle story so important to be recorded by all the gospel writers? Well, listen, the location of this story was on the northeastern shore of the Sea of Galilee. The time was Passover, which was when the Jews got together to remember their deliverance out of Egypt with the angel of death passing over their homes because of the lamb's blood on the doorpost. Passover was and still is an important time celebrated in the spring on the 15th day of the first month, lasting seven days. And according to the gospel writers, the multitude of folks were on their way to Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover. Jesus, who was a Jew, wasn't going to the Passover celebration this particular year because the last year he went, which was the year before, folks were trying to kill him. So this particular year, Jesus decided to chill by himself and remember the Passover with just him and God. Somebody in Zoom land say, well, that's enough company right there. This was probably the first Passover Jesus had missed since he was 12. Now he's 32 years old and it was one year exactly before his death. Jesus' cousin, John the Baptist, had been beheaded. And I would imagine that Jesus was in a deep, contemplative, deep thinking, deep wondering, not wanting to be bothered mood. Maybe Jesus was sad. Maybe Jesus was angry. Maybe Jesus was tired and he needed space. He needed to go off to be by himself, to get it together again, to clear his head and to talk with God. Maybe Jesus needed to get answers to questioning whether this was what he needed to do. Maybe in Jesus' humanity, in his fully human self, he was getting a little worried and weary when his time would come. In other words, Jesus was in a funk, slipping into depression. And the disciples weren't getting it. The folks wanted to be healed and made whole everywhere he turned. Jesus couldn't catch a break. People were pulling on him in every direction. He was even tempted by Satan. And Jesus just needed to steal away because I ain't got long to stay here. Well, the writer of the gospel tells us that when Jesus heard that John the Baptist was murdered, Jesus departed from there by boat to a deserted place by himself. Sometimes, beloved, you just don't want to be bothered with folks. And it's okay to steal away. It isn't healthy to always be available. Go somewhere, take care of yourself. But sometimes we let our mood swings overcome our purpose for getting away. Sad, moody, in your feelings, ain't no place for a child of God. And just when you think you're about to have a pity party all by yourself, the phone rings, somebody texts or sends an email, and for Jesus, God sends the multitudes, a bunch of hungry people who hadn't eaten in days because they had been walking to Jerusalem for the Passover. And here's Jesus, who was probably like, man, I wish they'd leave me alone because he thought he could have a good cry or even a good cuss all by himself and he wasn't going to celebrate Passover in a usual way. He knew he wasn't ready to die, but he knew he needed to keep up the family tradition. 
Beloved, how many times have you decided not to celebrate a holiday because you weren't able to go home, but you ended up celebrating anyway because God sent somebody with an invitation to invite you out of your pity party into celebrating life. And here's Jesus celebrating Passover by working one of his most marvelous miracles for the Passover bound crowd. God always has a way of taking our mind off of our situation or circumstance by putting folks who need us to represent God. And back to the story. Look at the text. Jesus made the folks sit down because Jesus loves order. God does things decent and in order. God is not a God of chaos or confusion, but of order. And notice this too. Jesus was not wasteful. He commanded that the leftovers be gathered up. What did the disciples do with the leftovers? Well, I'm so glad you asked in Zoom land. Don't miss the miracle here. From scarcity to abundance, with just a little, God can make leftovers. When we trust God, God can take our little bit, bless it, and cause us to have leftovers. When we think we didn't have enough, just trust God and watch God increase. Don't miss the miracle. When we stop thinking about our little, when we stop being stingy, when we stop worrying about how to pay this or that, when we stop penny pitching and start kingdom building, God can bless the little and cause an overflow. God can surely make a dollar out of 15 cents. God can bless a little and cause leftovers equally when we stop being greedy and hoarding. When Jeff Bezos made $73 million during the pandemic, when Mark Zuckerberg made $30 million during this pandemic, while folks are broke as a joke, and especially the poor folks who are convinced that a bankrupt, fake billionaire who don't give a fat rat's patootie about poor folks that would vote for somebody because of identity and single issue politics. Don't forget to go vote on Tuesday and Congress playing games with the unemployment stipends. God help us all. God help us to live out what we have on our currency. In God we trust. Try God and see God and won't God open up the windows of heaven and pour out blessings that you won't have enough room to receive. Well, I feel my help. Y'all praying in Zoom land. Beloved, why do we overdo it when it comes to eating? Yet when it comes to doing God's will, we starve ourselves in a spiritual anorexia of sorts underweight and malnourished from feasting upon foolishness of ingestible doctrine that sickens and weakens the soul to the point of salvation starvation. So many folks have left the church. They left because of constantly being fed lies and deceit that was slow cooked with craftiness, smothered in hypocrisy, tenderized by trickery, and then served as the word of God. And now the church is facing a salmonella outbreak rather than a salvation breakthrough and people have gotten food poisoning from fake Christians who have created a recipe to keep others sin sick rather than set free. Our menus have to change if there's nothing else we've learned in this pandemic. If we are able to be a viable church of the living God and people of faith, we have to make that which is spiritually edible and edifying to God for the equipment of the saints, for the work of ministry, for the uplifting of the body of Christ. Somebody in Zoom land needs a new diet today so that we can all be healthy when we can wear that full armor of God to fight this principalities. And after performing the multiplication miracle with five fish and three loaves of bread, the leftovers were gathered up. Beloved, before this pandemic, Perhaps the only time folks would come to church or participate in anything was because we fed them. Now, a pandemic potluck is not necessary. Folks are participating in Zoom land worship, Bible study, and church meetings virtually because it's spiritually enriching and a soul-saving experience. We have gotten rid of the fluff 
and turn to our faith. Thanks be to God. Those who knew the importance of a balanced diet, of feasting upon God's word and praying without ceasing. That balanced diet, not only on Sunday worship, but worship all week long. That balanced diet has sustained us in this pandemic. Am I right about it? I know I am. And we can keep on keeping on because the joy of the Lord is not only our strength, but we have tasted and seen that the Lord is good. Anybody in Zoom land ready to take a bow? Bite out of the bread of life, live on leftovers and live forever. Well, preacher, how in the world can we tell if we are eating this bread of heaven? How do we know if it's packaged correctly? Here's how you know that you're, you're eating right and living right. When you eat the bread from heaven, we ingest love, compassion, perseverance, kindness, patience, faith, and then we give off the same. When we eat this bread from heaven, we feast on the fact that troubles don't last always. When we eat this bread from heaven, we have strength and power to overcome life's ups and downs, the ills and ills of this world. But beloved, you have to want to taste to see that the Lord is still good and his mercy endures forever. I don't know about you, but I'm so glad that I'll never hunger or thirst because I got bread that sustains and blood that soothes. I got bread that fills me and blood that heals me. I got bread that's enough and blood that washes away my sins. Yes, we are where we eat from the head to the soles of our feet. Guide me, O thou great Jehovah. Pilgrim through this pandemic barren land. I am weak, but thou art mighty. Hold me with thy powerful hand. Bread of heaven, feed me till I won't no more. Beloved, I am so glad that Jesus didn't go to the Passover the year before his death so that there would be leftovers for you and me to live from this miracle of feeding the crowd with two fish and five loaves of bread. This is the kind of leftovers that last from everlasting to everlasting without an expiration date. This is the kind of leftovers that is preserved by the blood of the lamb, seasoned with grace and mercy, Flavor locked fresh from Calvary's cross. These leftovers need no refrigeration to keep from spalling or microwave to warm up. It's best at room temperature. It's best to keep out on the table as a reminder what God can do with just a little. All we have to do is have faith enough to feast, faith enough to trust, faith enough to know that God can give you more than you could ever imagine. Faith to know that when we do our part, God will do God's part. Every little bit for the kingdom blesses more folks than you think. Jesus blessed, broke, and unselfishly gave his life so that we can live on leftovers for eternity. Sometimes, beloved, we have to be willing to be broken. Because in our brokenness, there is a blessing. We must be willing to take risks. God can take the little that we see and can increase. Don't miss the miracle today of living on leftovers because we are where we eat. An apple today may keep the doctor away, but I declare Jesus each day will keep evil away. You don't have to wait to feast on Jesus. You can taste them late at night. You can have a piece of bread when you're burdened down. This bread will never go stale. In fact, it's better three days old because this bread rolls to heaven three days after being cooked, kneaded, and scorned crucified for you and me. Go ahead and feast on this wonder bread and drink from Emmanuel's vein. This table is prepared for you today to feast upon the broken body of our Lord and Savior. Let this be your daily bread and drink his precious blood for the forgiveness of sin. When you feast upon Jesus, I declare you'll stop counting carbs and cholesterol and start counting blessings. And you will always, hallelujah, experience more than enough to where you will have leftovers so that you can be a blessing. I don't know about you, beloved, today, but oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Why? Because he first loved me. Beloved, I don't know about you today, but I'm so glad that Jesus thought that I was worth saving. I'm so glad that he thought that I was worth dying for, that he would save my life, that I might be free. Hallelujah, free to tell everyone 
everyone. He thought that I was worth it. Oh, yes, he did. To the glory of God. Is there somebody today? Is there somebody who didn't know that they were worth it today? <laughs> 